the rule of our faith, the rule of our practice, the rule of our lives as Christians. And what we want to do this hour is to look at, if you want to think of it this way, kind of the next two of the solas, uh, the next two of these central theological commitments of the Reformation. And we want to look specifically at sola fide and solus Christus, faith alone and Christ alone. And we'll be looking at them specifically in terms of how those two fit together. How together they form the reformational understanding specifically of salvation. And to do that, uh, kind of leaning on the idea of sola scriptura, we're going to be working out of a specific passage of scripture. Uh, so if you have your Bible with you or uh, you can grab one from the pew rack in front of you, if you'll turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, uh, we'll be looking at verses 15 through 21. And we'll spend some time in this passage and see in it uh, this doctrine so central to the Reformation. So Galatians chapter 2, beginning at verse 15, but before we read, let's bow in prayer. Our great God in heaven, we give you thanks this morning for your word. We rejoice, O oh Lord, that you are the God who dwells in light that is inaccessible, that even the angels who encircle your throne are forced to cover their eyes, for they are unable to behold your glory. And yet you, O oh Lord, are the God who has revealed yourself, who has spoken, who has given us truth, a truth so that even... Now, in this place, we are able to open your word and to read the very breath of God on the page of a book. And we give you thanks, O Lord, for your word. We give you thanks for the power uh, that is in that word and for the promise that you have made that when that word goes forth out of your mouth, that it shall not return unto you void, but that it shall certainly accomplish the purposes that you have intended. O Lord, today as we and now read and consider your word again. We pray for that promise to be realized in our midst. And through your word, O oh Lord, exalt Jesus, we pray. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Galatians chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. Hear the word of the Lord. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Amen. And when I was in seminary, I encountered for the first time, it had been around for a while, but I just hadn't come across it, something called evangelism explosion. Now, some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. Uh, evangelism explosion is essentially an approach to evangelism that encourages you, when you're sharing the gospel with others, to begin with a simple question. And the question is this. If God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And that's the question. 
Now, I am not speaking for or against evangelism explosion, but it's a decent question. Consider the question. If God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? What would you say? You know, 500 years ago, this is one of the foremost questions, maybe framed a little differently, but it's one of the foremost questions that was consuming the church. What is it that makes sinners acceptable in the presence of the holy God? Well, that's precisely the issue that the Apostle Paul confronts in the passage that we read just a minute ago. Now, from the very first verses of Galatians, if you're familiar uh, with this book of the Scriptures, from the very first verses of Galatians chapter 1, it has been clear that there is a serious problem in Galatia. You know, the churches in the region of Galatia, the churches to whom Paul is writing this letter, these are churches that Paul himself had planted. In their infancy, Paul had given these churches the gospel. But recently, false teachers had come, they'd infiltrated the churches in Galatia, and they were teaching lies. They were teaching false doctrine. And a reality that you can see almost breaking Paul's heart as he writes the letter, the Galatian Christians, they were starting to believe the lies. They were starting to believe the false doctrine that was being taught by these teachers. But Paul, he's not mild about it. He doesn't consider this false teaching that the false teachers are propagating. He doesn't consider it simply false doctrine. For Paul, what's being taught in Galatia is another gospel. That's what he calls it in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. These teachings that vary from Paul's teachings, they're not just mistakes in the gospel. They're not just differences of opinion. They're a different gospel altogether. They're not even the same thing. And Paul's very blunt. Paul's very direct with the Galatians about how serious this is. In both verse 8 and verse 9 of Galatians chapter 1, Paul has some very harsh words. In verse 8, Paul writes this. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. If the Galatians hear any gospel other than the one that Paul had proclaimed to them, no matter who brings it, Paul says to let that messenger be accursed. And our English translators there have sanitize that a bit. But you probably get a sense of what it means. What Paul says is that if anyone brings any other gospel, let that person be damned. Let him literally be confined to hell itself. You know, there are some differences of opinion on various theological issues, and we're to show unity in spite of those differences. But there's some differences that are unbridgeable. There are some points of doctrine where if you differ, you don't have the gospel. And this is one of those places, Paul says. This is serious. This is salvation. From the very start, Paul makes clear that what he is discussing here is of the utmost importance. As you move into Galatians chapter 2, the drama of the letter only continues. The first 14 verses of Galatians chapter 2, kind of leading up to where we read a minute ago, Paul tells us that, well, he tells the Galatians and he tells us about this almost unbelievable situation that had unfolded. You know, Paul tells us that he was with Peter. They're in the city of Antioch. The two of them were fellowshipping with the Gentile Christians in that city. They even were sharing table fellowship. They were eating with the Gentile brethren. Now that's something that never would have happened under the Old Testament regulations. It's something that never would have happened outside of the brotherhood and the freedom that Christ had brought. But then, 
Some brethren from the Jerusalem church, Paul says, they arrived. And when those Jerusalem brethren arrived in Antioch, all of a sudden Peter, he stopped eating with the Gentiles. Peter started acting as if a man standing before God was affected by his adherence to the Mosaic law. And Paul tells us that he offered Peter a stark rebuke. Now in the passage that we read just a minute ago, we read the conclusion of what Paul had said to Peter on that doubtlessly tense evening in Antioch. Can you imagine the evening when the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter stood at odds, at least for a moment, with each other? And in telling us about this confrontation and telling the Galatian Christians about this confrontation, Paul very obviously is showing a parallel to the situation in Galatia, a parallel to the situation that's being faced by the men and women to whom he's writing this letter. You see, the false teachers who had infiltrated the church in Galatia and the false teachers who had, or the, the Jews who had come up from Jerusalem, they were of the same peace. Now the Jews, or the false teachers who had come into Galatia, they were known as the Judaizers. And they were teaching that to be saved, you had to believe in Jesus and you had to be circumcised. You had to keep the Old Testament law. That's what these false teachers in Galatia were teaching. So the false teachers in Galatia and the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem they were all making the same fundamental error. They were misunderstanding and therefore they were abusing the law. The law never was given to save men. It never was intended to give men a 10 point to do list by which they could win God's favor. It wasn't given as instruction in how to win righteousness. But the sinful hearts of men, they twisted the law. And they'd come to see the law as a way to win God's favor through obedience. The law, they said, was something you could keep. It was something you had to keep in order to be saved. And you see the same sort of teaching throughout Jesus' lifetime and in his interaction with the Pharisees. You see it throughout Paul's letters. There were many who, like the false teachers in Galatia, like the Jewish Christians uh, from Jerusalem, there were many who thought that by keeping the law, you could win God's favor. In fact, they thought that to win God's favor, you had to keep the law. And that's why the false teachers in Galatia were teaching that in order to be saved, you had to believe in Christ and you had to keep the law. The law brought righteousness. The law was necessary to righteousness. That's what they taught. But they were wrong. And that's the error that Paul is savagely attacking throughout the book of Galatians. Paul is uh, concerned with the question of what makes a man righteous in the sight of God. He's not most fundamentally concerned about eating with one another or about circumcision. Most fundamentally, he's concerned with this question, what makes a man righteous in the sight of God? Now in chapter 2, verse 15, where we began reading just a few minutes ago, Paul, he's still reporting what he had said to Peter in Antioch. And those words of rebuke that Paul spoke to Peter, they strike at the very heart of Peter's error. They strike at the very heart of the lies that the Galatian Christians were beginning to believe. Because they strike at this central issue of what makes a man righteous in the sight of God? How was a sinful man made acceptable in the presence of God? That's the question Paul wants to know. There's, that's the question Martin Luther, John Calvin, all the others wanted to know. It's the question we need to know. And the answer Paul gives is very simple. The people of God are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Now, all of this, pretty obviously, is bound up with the issue of justification. If there's one theological issue, one point of doctrine 
that's more prominent than any other in the book of Galatians. It's the issue of justification. It was a central theme of the Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther famously commenting that it's uh, the, the doctrine of justification on which the church stands or falls. The issue of justification looms huge in the book of Galatians. Uh, Paul really treats it most densely in chapters 3 and 4 of the book, but really from Galatians 1.1 1, 1 to Galatians 6.18, you can't read a verse without seeing the importance of justification for the life of the Christians in Galatia, both their life here and now as the body of Christ and their life eternal. And of course, the doctrine of justification continued to be a contentious issue. We see how it was important not only to Paul but to Martin Luther. It continues to be a contentious issue even in our own day. You know, one of the reasons why studying the Reformation is not just an exercise in history. Now, the things that the Reformers were fighting against, the truths they were teaching, are still prevalent today. The errors being made then are still being made today. They're being made at times in our own churches. Now, the truths being expounded by the Reformers are still as needed, they're still as obscured today as they were 500 years ago, oftentimes. And so today we are as in need of clear teaching on justification as were the men and women of Wittenberg in 1517. Now, what we want to do here is to focus on this particular passage in Galatians to see uh, this reformational doctrine that we continue to need. And look particularly at chapter 2, verse 16, uh, right toward the beginning of the section we read a moment ago. Uh, in Galatians 2, 16, Paul writes this. He says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The Galatians have a problem. And the problem isn't the false teachers in their midst. It isn't the lies that have disfigured the gospel. Those are problems too. But the Galatians have a problem with God. Because like all of us, the Galatians are sinners. As Paul elsewhere will write in Romans 3 verse 23, they have sinned and they have fallen short of the glory of God. As Paul will write in Romans 6 23, the wages of that sin is death. The prophet Habakkuk tells us in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 that God will not and God cannot abide sin in His presence. And so the Galatians are condemned. You know, to come before God for them is to enter into the immolation of judgment, to be consumed by the holy fire of God. That's a problem. And Paul in Galatians 2.16 wants to discuss with them the solution. And Paul's discussion, if you noticed, it's a little repetitive. Three times in that one verse, Paul says the same thing. He says some version of, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. This is important. This is the answer to the Galatians' problem. And so Paul, he wants to make certain that they get it. You know, he had thought that they had known it. He had thought it was ingrained in them when he left Galatia. But they seem to have forgotten. And so Paul's going to press it on them again. As Paul says in the first iteration of that truth in verse 16, he says, A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. You right there in one sentence is the biblical doctrine of justification. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, there's one thing that you remember from what I've said over the course of this conference. Let it be that sentence. Forget everything I've said. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. But what do those words mean? Now, I suspect that most of you know what those words mean. But as I mentioned a little bit ago, there's a, 
really a firestorm of debate, even in the church today, and there has been for some time, over the doctrine being held out here. And the letter to the Galatians itself is testimony to the fact that the understanding of justification can so quickly be corrupted. It had been for the Galatians. And so we want to be very attentive to work carefully through these words. Now some of this might seem a little pedantic, things you already know, but these are points at which the soul-saving, Christ-glorifying truth of the gospel is being challenged. And not just in Paul's day, not just in the Reformer's day, in our day. And so we need to be clear on the truth so that when we see an imposter, when we see another gospel, as Paul calls it, we can spot it. So let's be precise. You know, this is the answer to our problem. This is the answer of justification. And Paul begins in verse 16 by writing, a man is not justified. And already, you have to stop. You know, what does Paul mean when he writes about being justified? Well, when Paul writes about justification, when any of the biblical authors write about justification, they're dealing with a very specific thing. Justification is a legal word. It's a legal category. It, it deals with things that would happen in a court of law. Specifically, to be justified means to be declared righteous in the eyes of the court, in the eyes of the judge. If you appear before a judge accused of some crime or another and you are justified, that means that rather than the judge declaring you guilty, he declares you righteous. You're upright. You're without spot. There's no stain. That's what justification is. It's to be declared righteous. You're in the right. Now on the one hand, the Apostle Paul likely would have thought it a little bit silly to spend any amount of time at all talking about the fact that justification means to declare someone righteous. In the Greek language in which Paul was writing his letter, righteousness and justification, they sound different in English. In Greek, they're variations of the same word. You can tell by looking at them that they're related. You can tell that to justify means to declare righteous. It's almost as if it means to, to righteousize, to make up a word. To justify is to declare righteous. But you don't have to know the Greek language to see the connection. You know, it's evident in places like Romans chapter 8 in verses 33 and 34. You know, those verses come in the midst of Paul's soaring discussion about the love of God that we find in Christ. And in the midst of that discussion, Paul mentions justification several times. But in verses 33 and 34, he phrases things in a very helpful way. In Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 33, Paul writes this, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? You know, Paul, he very clearly has a legal courtroom setting in mind. He writes about someone bringing a charge against God's people. He's talking about a courtroom. And then look what Paul does. Faced with the accusations being made, the two options are that the person in question can be either justified or condemned declared by the judge to be either righteous or guilty. There's no third option. Now, we won't get into the mud too much, but there's a disheartening number of people today, you know, authors, teachers, who say that justification is not a legal category. That justification has to do with a person's status within the community of God's people. That justification has more to do with your standing in the church than it has to do with your standing before the holy God. But Romans 8, 33 and 34 is clear. A man stands before the heavenly tribunal. A charge is brought. Two things could be spoken by the judge. Either words of justification or words of condemnation. Justification is a legal declaration of righteousness. For Paul, for all the biblical authors, 
That's what justification is. A legal declaration of righteous. A declaration from the judge that this man is righteous. This woman is righteous. And Paul here, he, he very clearly isn't talking about just any judge. He's talking about the divine judge. To be justified for Paul means to be declared righteous by God himself. As you already, you see how justification really cuts to the very heart of the central human crisis. The central human need in every generation, not just first century Galatians, not just reformers 500 years ago, but today here in our churches, in our families. One day, all of us, each of us, will stand before the righteous throne of the living God. He'll look upon us. He'll look upon you. And each one of you, individually, personally, will be either justified or condemned. This isn't an abstract theological principle that Paul is discussing. This deals with your standing before the living God of all creation. And that God, as we know, He requires perfect holiness. You know, David tells us in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, that only those who are pure and undefiled will enter into His presence. So by our sin, we all deserve condemnation. You know, this past week, when you lost your temper with your spouse, when you were short with your child, that deserves condemnation. When we hear on the news the sorts of rebellion that's in our culture, and your heart whispers, thank goodness I'm not that bad. That pride deserves condemnation. When you've passed gossip, when you've harbored a lustful thought, when you felt the rush of pride, all of those things and so many more, they all deserve condemnation. If we could bring you up here, read through a record of all of your thoughts, gaze into your heart, if we could see your pettiness, your pride, if we right now could see those things that you know your reputation depends on no one else knowing, we'd have to say, he's guilty. She's guilty. You know, justification isn't just something that you study at a Reformation 500 conference. Justification is something that you need. Based on your record, if you were called before the righteous judge this moment, the pronouncement undeniably would be guilty. Because you are guilty, aren't you? If you think that in yourself, in your own works, you're not guilty, and brothers and sisters, that very pride itself is your condemnation. You need justification. We all need justification. So we desperately need to know how it is that we're justified. Now, we're just a little bit into Galatians 2.16. We've discussed what Paul means when he writes about a man being justified. So let's push forward. Again, Galatians 2.16 a man is not justified by the works of the law. Your justification, this declaration of righteousness, it does not come through works of the law. Well, what are works of the law? It seems pretty obvious, especially when you remember the setting in which Paul initially spoke these words to the apostle Peter. And as you recall, when the decidedly Jewish faction of Christians had come to Antioch, Peter had stopped eating with the Gentile Christians. This was an action, this was a stoppage rooted squarely in the Old Testament law, the law that had forbidden Jews from eating with Gentiles. Paul, of course, was livid. And he chastises Peter with these words, beginning halfway through verse 14 of Galatians chapter 2. Paul says to Peter, If you, being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? 
We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, and then he continues. In Paul's rebuff to Peter, he refers to Peter compelling Gentiles to live as Jews, by which he means expecting Gentiles to follow the Old Testament law. You know, earlier in Galatians, Paul had said that in this, Peter and uh, the others, the Jews from Jerusalem, the Christians from Jerusalem, that they were trying to Jewishize the Gentiles, is the word Paul used, kind of made up a word for himself. They're trying to Jewishize the Gentiles. They want them to follow the Old Testament law. They want them to live like Old Testament Jews. They want them to do all that the law commands. But Paul, he's incredulous why Peter would do this. Because, as he writes in verse 16, he and Peter both know that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And you see what Paul does there. He refers to living as Jews, you know, keeping the Old Testament law. Paul refers to that as works of the law. When Paul refers to works of the law, he is referring to obeying the Old Testament law in an effort to make yourself acceptable before God. This is the effort to win righteousness by your own obedience, to be good enough, to be obedient enough for God to declare you righteous because you deserve it. To have something that you have done to which you can point to at the very least validate the declaration of righteousness, even if not cause that declaration altogether. And Paul says that it's impossible no man, no woman can obtain righteousness by his or her obedience. As Paul go on to write in Galatians chapter 5, verse 3, if we want to try this approach, if you want to try to win righteousness by the works of the law, you have to keep the whole law. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thyself a graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt... Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know how it goes. The whole thing. If you're seeking righteousness this way, you have to keep the whole thing. It can't be done. Particularly when you remember Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. That obedience isn't just a matter of outward actions. Obedience is a matter of the heart. So all of the commandments, they don't have to be kept just in what you do and what you uh, do outwardly. They have to be kept in what you think, what you say, and how you feel, and how you look. It can't be done. As Paul says, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In fact, Paul will go on to discuss later in Galatians that righteousness by the law never was the intention of the law in the first place. The law never was given to provide a way for men to obtain righteousness. But even that aside, Paul's meaning here is clear. No one can or will be declared righteous because of what he or she has done. The works of the law can't justify. And thankfully, Paul doesn't stop there in Galatians 2.16. You know, look at the verse again. Galatians 2.16, he says, A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. It's faith in Christ that justifies. Sola fide, solus Christus, faith alone, in Christ alone. A man, a woman, is declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. When a man or a woman stands before the judgment throne of God, when he stands before the judge whose eyes penetrate into the very soul, he's declared righteous, not because of his works, but because of faith in Christ. Now we're used to hearing that. I hope you're used to hearing that. But if we're honest, if we reflect upon it, it's a little bit shocking. It's a little bit of a scandal. Because, be honest, you know that you're not righteous. You know that you've sinned. 
Yeah, I could tell you precisely where I was, precisely what I was doing, when I nearly was crushed under the weight of Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. When you've been at your depths, God was there. And he saw. When you have done things or said things or felt things that you are so desperately grateful that nobody knows about. God was there and he saw. So how can God, the just judge who always does rightly, who saw that thing, how can he declare you righteous? Our faith rests on the fact that God is holy. He's just. He's good. He doesn't lie. How can he call you righteous? How can God call you who have done that? How can he call you righteous without his being a liar? That's something to which Paul re refers repeatedly in Galatians. You look at chapter 3, verse 13. There Paul writes, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The curse of the law is death. Those who break the law, those who thereby come under its curse, they're sentenced to death, eternal, agonizing death. Not death that you see that comes and leaves and it leaves behind a body, but eternal, agonizing death. That's the curse of the law. And Jesus has taken that curse upon himself for his people. Or as Paul writes back in Galatians 1 verse 4, Jesus gave himself for our sins. Jesus died as a substitute for his people under the weight of the curse that ought to have crushed them. In Galatians 2 verse 20, we read it at the beginning of our time. Paul states the matter this way. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Paul here opens up a view whose glory has no bottom. At the end of the verse, Paul refers to Jesus giving himself up for Paul. You're obviously referring to Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross. Well, at the start of the verse, start of verse or, uh, Galatians 2.20, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Christ liveth in me. Paul is describing his enjoyment of the saving benefits of Calvary in terms of union with Christ. Through faith, Believers are united with Christ in such a way that they are in Him. And He is in them. They are united together with a union that's so intimate, so complete, that Paul can actually say that He was crucified in the darkness of Calvary. And Christ right then lives in Him. He's united to Christ. And through that union, this glorious exchange takes place. In the first place, the sin of God's people is placed on Jesus. Jesus bears their sin. He dies under its curse. That's what oftentimes is called the passive obedience of Christ. God says that whoever violates the law must die. And Christ renders obedience to God's will by passively receiving that death. That's his passive obedience. He's obeying not so much by doing as by receiving. Jesus takes the sin of his people upon himself and he dies in their place. But to bring a sinner into the presence of God, that's not enough. 
You heard me correctly. To bring a sinner into God's presence, Jesus taking away that sinner's sin by his death, it's not enough. Remember, what does it mean to be justified? It means to be declared righteous. Not just forgiven, but righteous. They're not the same thing. It's not enough to just be without sin. You have to actually possess righteousness. You think about Adam in the garden before the fall. He had no sin, but he still needed something. He still needed righteousness. He needed obedience to the command of God. And the same is true for us. We don't just need our sin taken away. We need a positive righteousness if we're to be declared righteous by the divine judge. And we receive that righteousness again through union with Christ. From the moment of his conception in the womb of the virgin to the end of his days, Jesus Christ was without sin. Never in his actions, in his emotions, in his thoughts, never did he transgress the law of God. Jesus fulfilled the law in its grand sweep, in its most minute detail. And by that obedience, he won a righteousness, a righteousness by the law, and that righteousness he then gives to his people, a people who now aren't only forgiven, but righteous. They're righteous because of the Jesus with whom they are united by faith. You know, Paul puts it very succinctly in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, when he writes, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was made our sin. We're made his righteousness. Paul had taught the Galatians all of this before. And he's prodding them here to remember it. Remember, you're united with Christ. He's in you. Your hope is in your union with Christ. It's not in a cut in the flesh or the food on your plate. Your hope is in Christ. That is justification. Not obedience to Old Testament regulations, but sin washed clean and a covering of righteousness that's given through the believer's union with Christ. You know, consider the, the reality that Paul's holding forth here. In the darkness of Calvary, in the pitch black filthiness of Golgotha, the Son of God was bearing the sin of His people. The beloved Son had become the accursed one. The one whose glory fills the heavenly temple was in the abyss of judgment. Because when the father looked upon his son, he saw all of the sin of all of his people. The first rebellion of Adam and Eve, the drunkenness of Noah, Abraham's lack of faith in Egypt, David's adultery and his murder, Peter's, Peter's relentless denial, your impatience with your family, your lustful looks and thoughts, your refusal to put to death your bitterness and your resentment for past hurts. And the curse due to all of that sin was poured out on Jesus. The just wrath of God and the sin of His people colliding in the heaving body of the crucified Jesus. That wrath poured out upon that sin until both of them were gone. So that now when God looks upon His people, when He looks upon you, if you've been given faith in Him, He doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. The righteousness of the one over whom he has declared, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You know, one of the, 
One of the scars of sin, one of the scars it leaves on your soul is that it lingers. You can't forget it. And you feel that no one else can forget it either. You fear that when you walk into a room, when you walk in certain circles from your past, goodness forbid, when you walk into church, you just know that everyone looks at you and it flashes through their minds. Oh, well, there's, there's that man who did that thing. There's that woman who used to be that way. I remember how she used to be. There's that failure of a father. There's that terrible mother. But God never does that. If you're a Christian, the God who always was there, He looks on you and He sees Jesus, the beloved Son. Can you fathom the love of the triune God for His people? You know, there will come a, a day when all of us will stand before God. There will come a day when I will stand before God. And I'll stand before a searing holiness that could melt me. And I won't plead that I was a pastor. I won't plead that I've done this or that I've done that. I won't cross-reference what anyone else has said about me. I won't trot out a date on which I first believed. I won't even tremble because of all of my failings because of all the many people I've disappointed. I won't tremble because of my sin. But I'll be able to look to the man who died on Calvary, the man who rose again, and I'll know that the judge is looking at the same man. Because as a Christian, you're in him and his righteous covers you as the waters cover the depths of the sea. That's the glory of justification. The soul settling comfort of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And Paul tells us in getting back to Galatians 2.16 that it all comes by faith, faith alone in Christ alone. When a man or a woman is brought to faith, when he's given faith by the Holy Spirit, he's justified. His sins washed clean in the blood of Christ. The righteousness of Jesus himself is placed in his account. The Christian isn't declared righteous by God because of anything that he's done or because of anything in him, but because of what Jesus has done that then is imputed to him, credited to his account through his union with Christ. By faith, the Christian is justified. Faith unites him to the Jesus who is his justification. But here's the thing, and this is where theological error Heresy really gets so tricky, so precise. You know, from what we can tell in the book of Galatians, the Judaizers, the false teachers there, they never denied that faith in Christ was important. They said you have to believe in Jesus. They believed in justification by faith. But they didn't believe in justification by faith alone. And that's what made their gospel so-called. No gospel at all. The Judaizers said that to be justified, you had to believe in Jesus and render obedience to certain parts of the Mosaic law. You had to be circumcised, had to follow the dietary laws, all of that. But Paul's very clear throughout Galatians that justification is not only by faith, but it's by faith alone. It's not faith plus obedience that makes you righteous. It's not faith plus works that justifies. It's faith alone that justifies a man or a woman before God. You know, Paul states, states it very poignantly in Galatians 5 verse 2. There he writes, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, 
Christ will profit you nothing. Now there it's critical to remember the context, the setting in which Paul is writing. In Galatia, the Judaizers are teaching that circumcision is necessary to salvation because being circumcised is part of keeping the Old Testament law. So circumcision in this setting, it's an attempt to earn righteousness through one's own works. It's an attempt to be justified by what you've done. To be circumcised is, to use Paul's language from Galatians 2.16, to be circumcised is an attempt to be justified by the works of the law. And so in Galatians chapter 5 verse 2, he's saying what he says in so many other places in his letters. If you go down the path of adding anything of your works to your justification, then your justification will be determined entirely by your works. You're either justified by works without any reference to faith, or you're justified by faith without any reference to works. There's no third option. There's no middle mixture of the two. You know, Paul states the matter very clearly in Romans 11, verse 6, where he writes, If by grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's works, then it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. You see, justification is either through works or it's through faith, and the two can't be combined. If you're to be justified, it must be entirely, fully, wholly through faith. What Christ has done and not what you've done. That must be 100% of the foundation upon which you're declared righteous. In Galatians 2.21, Paul states this truth really in an incredibly provocative way. Verse 21, Paul says, If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If something that mankind can do, if some obedience that you can render could be, obedient, could be righteous in God's sight, if righteousness could come through the law in that way, then Calvary, the death of Jesus, was pointless. If you this morning are capable of doing anything to make yourself righteous, then Jesus didn't have to die to make you righteous. If you're able to do anything toward winning God's favor or approval, if you're able this morning to do anything that's good enough, then Jesus Christ very literally wasted himself on Calvary's cross. And he may as well have remained in the glories, the bliss of heaven, and let you take care of yourself. That's what Paul's saying. But Jesus didn't waste himself. Justification comes only because of what Jesus has done, not because of anything that we've done, not because of anything that we've contributed. God's people are justified by faith alone. You know, regardless of what the lies, or of what lies these false teachers might be spreading in Galatia, that's the gospel that Paul had preached. The gospel of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Now, where do you look for justification this morning? You know, as Paul says with such painful clarity, really, at the close of verse 16, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You've heard me say those words many times already. But think about it. On the surface, the works of the law, they're good things. And their efforts to obey God's own commandments. But that obedience, even obedience to the good commands of God, can't forgive a sinner. They can't take away a sin. So this morning, where are you looking? Are you looking to the works of the law to save you? Do you think that you're made acceptable in God's sight? Do you think that you've won God's favor by your service to the church? by the length of your service in the church, maybe by your upstanding morality and reputation, maybe by the, the good spouse or the good parent or the good grandparent or the good child that you've been. 
Do you think you're justified because of your compassion for others? Because of your care for the needy? Do you think that any of these things win you favor in God's sight? They don't. Nothing that you can do can win the favor of God. Only Jesus can do that. Nothing that you can do can win the favor of God. Not even your decision, so to speak, to believe in Jesus. In Galatians, Paul argues passionately that justification comes only through faith in Christ. And so people so easily start to think that faith actually earns justification, that their decision to believe, so to speak, that their kind of personal experiential encounter with gospel truth is an act that makes them righteous. Brothers and sisters, a man is not justified by the works of the law. Nothing that man can do can win the favor of God. Even your act of believing, even your exercise of faith, it doesn't win God's favor. But rather, God sovereignly and graciously gives faith to His people. He gives them a gift that they haven't deserved. Faith itself. And that faith then unites them to Christ. And through that union, God's people are given forgiveness and covering righteousness. That brings us back to the question with which we began a little while ago. Maybe you remember what the question was. The question from Evangelism Explosion. If God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Well, what did you answer in your mind? What, what will you answer in that day? You know, the Judaizers, the false teachers in Galatia, they would have answered, because I believe in Jesus and I've kept the law. What will you say? What if it were me? I wouldn't say that God should let me into his heaven because I'm an upstanding man. I wouldn't say that God should let me into heaven because I'm a pastor or because I'm a seminary professor. I wouldn't even say that God should let me into heaven because I believe in Jesus. I would say that God should let me into his heaven because Jesus Christ has taken away my sin and he's given me his righteousness. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. The work of Jesus that's been applied to me by faith that the Spirit has given to me. My hope isn't in my works. It isn't in my faith. It's in Jesus. He who loved me and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, we must live, struggle to live faithful, obedient lives. But we must trust in Jesus. Because it's as true today as it was in Paul's day, as it was in the days of the Reformation, that no man will be justified by the works of the law, by what they've done, by what they've decided, by what they've experienced. The people of God will stand before the judgment throne and they will be declared righteous. They will be justified by faith alone in Christ alone. If any man preaches to you any other gospel, let him be damned. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we come before you this morning grateful beyond all expression for the gospel of salvation in Christ. Lord, we confess that we are a sinful people. We see our wickedness and our rebellion. When we consider your law, we see, O oh Lord, our own wretchedness. And yet we confess that there is so much more defilement within us that our eyes are unable to see. But defilement that you see. 
And so we give you thanks, O Lord, for the blood of the Lord Jesus. That blood that washes clean every transgression of his people. That blood that covers with righteousness those who belong to you. We rejoice, O Lord, in the blessed good news of your word. That if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all transgression. Just because you have judged the sin of your people in Christ and you've given them his righteousness so that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, these are truths beyond our ability to comprehend but you by your spirit, O oh Lord, have preserved them through the generations. You have brought them into increasing clarity. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bring them ever more clarity even in our own day. And Lord, we are mindful that we are encircled by those who would teach false doctrine, who would rob the blessed Lord Jesus of his soul glory in the salvation of sinners. We pray, O oh Lord, that Christ would be exalted, and that He would be high and lifted up, and that sinners would be drawn to Him. He whose yoke is easy and whose burden is life, and in whom there is life forevermore. We pray, O oh Lord, that You would accomplish these things, that You would get glory to Christ in all corners of His dominion and in our hearts. Do it, we pray. We ask it in the victorious name of Jesus. Amen.